This video contains flashing lights, unsettling content, violent content, jump scares and sudden loud noises. Viewer discretion advised. Everyone has something they desire in life. It can vary greatly from wealth, strength, or just wanting luck. Nonetheless, humanity has tried to find ways to obtain these things, eventually diving into the supernatural. From contacting restless spirits to unearthing a dead god, many have managed to obtain their heart's desire. However, like every deal, they all have a price to them. Let us regale you with the top 10 ritual creepypastas too. Baseball Boy In Queen Elizabeth Elementary School, go to the school's playground on a Sunday evening between 6.25 p.m. and 6.45 p.m. You can bring only one item with you, like a vehicle or a camera, but nothing that will distract you. You can also do this ritual without any items. Head towards the swing set and sit on the seat on the right. It'll take several minutes for anything to happen. Though, if you start swinging, the process can be sped up. If you turn around, you should start seeing the form of a child walking towards you, holding a black bat. Don't stare too long, otherwise he'll run away. Soon, the boy will call out to you asking for your name. Don't give it to him. Instead, just tell him your name isn't important. The boy will then ask you if you want to play baseball. If you wish to leave, this is your last chance. Tell him you're not good at the sport, or you need to go home. If you do decide to play with him, he'll lead you to the baseball diamond. He'll start playing baseball with you, Though it's the way a little kid might interpret the game. The game will consist of you throwing a ball at him, hitting him with his bat, and running around the diamond. This will repeat for a while, ranging from 10 minutes to 3 hours. Do not try to leave the game prematurely, as that will cause the boy to go enraged at you, and there's no surviving accounts of what happens after. If you play baseball with the boy all the way to the end, the boy will come to you, happy, and hand you the old, withered ball, thanking you for playing with him. The boy will then leave, and you can too. Just make sure to go in the opposite direction the boy went, and leave the school grounds. Once you're finally indoors, you can strip a small piece of the ball and carry the strip in your pocket. You'll now have the ability of extreme foresight, predicting any accidents, expecting anything out of the ordinary, etc. Carry the strip long enough and the power will absorb into you, letting you have the power for as long as possible. Though there are some side effects, including extreme bodily aches, How to beat the Sandman If you're brave or foolish, you can challenge the Lord of Sleep, the Sandman, to conquer yourself of never having to sleep again. To begin, you'll need a marker capable of drawing on your skin, a candle with the means to light it, and a 60-minute hourglass, meaning any way in can be closed either by closing a window or door, and it's important to remove any timekeeping devices besides the hourglass. To perform the ritual, it must be 8 p.m. Ensure all exit ways are closed and curtains closed to block outside light. Draw a simple hourglass shape on the back of one of your hands, ensuring you remember which one. Light the candle, turn off all the other lights, and sit on the floor with your prepared objects. Flip the hourglass so the sand starts to fall, 
then clearly say, I'm not tired and I refuse to go to sleep. Close your eyes and count to 10. Upon opening your eyes, there will be something else in the room with you, though you may not be able to clearly make out their shape. Your goal is simply to stay awake as long as possible, with the limit being eight hours. Every hour you must flip the hourglass, each time marking your previously marked arm. There's no way to cheat by rapidly flipping the hourglass, since you'll be unable to do so. If you fail to flip the hourglass before the last grain falls, then you lose. If you succumb to sleep at any point, you also lose. Each hour that passes, the game becomes more difficult. The Sandman uses a variety of tricks such as playing gentle sounds of music boxes or speaking many different voices, perhaps some more recognizable. Other times attacking with hallucinations of the hanging dead, flashing spotlights, and the feeling of the room shifting and closing in. Once the final hour starts, the Sandman will begin to address you directly. He will probe your sleep-deprived brain with questions, trying to distract you from the hourglass. At any point in the game, you may concede by taking the hourglass and smashing it. You will receive no reward, but neither will you suffer the wrath of the Sandman. Should you resist the win out, and you make the last mark on your arm, then you don't need to flip the hourglass. Simply mark your arm the eighth time. Close your eyes and wait. The Sandman will then speak to you directly, informing you you have beaten him at the game. Collect the hourglass, snuff out the candle, and then leave. Now your slumber shall begin for 12 hours. If you were indeed successful, then once you wake up after 12 hours, you'll feel refreshed and discover that for each mark you made on your arm, it's one hour daily you don't need to sleep. However, there are severe consequences should you lose the game or make mistakes. If you mark the wrong arm, or try to mark your arm more than the hourglass tally allows, then you'll instead require one more hour of sleep each day per incorrect mark, which can undo all your efforts. Should you fall into a slumber, you'll sleep for 12 hours, but will be filled with the worst nightmares and horrors your mind can handle. You'll be locked in a perpetual torment, unable to escape until the 12 hours pass. The Dead Poets Game The Dead Poets Game is a ritual that was popular in Great Britain around the late 1800s during the Industrial Revolution. This was during a time when superstition was a phenomenon that easily swept the land. Many who heard of it back then mostly only talked of ghosts and goblins around Northern Europe. The game was played publicly in front of a large audience in the London Theatre by a psychic named Alexander Kingsley. He had done feats that baffled many to this day, but near the twilight of his career, decided to try the Dead Poets game, a foolish act that led to his ultimate downfall. There are key rules that need to be followed, which Alexander did not. Make sure you are locked in a room, alone. The only light permitted in the room is candlelight from a single candle. You must have no technology of any kind in the room when you start. You need two glasses of wine or the alcohol of your choice. The glasses indicate you mean no harm to the spirit. A table and two chairs are needed, one for each of you. The table must be placed where the spirit died, one chair at their head, another at their legs. Who you aim to summon is important, as calm or nice souls or those who once were a poet are key to a successful session. When you are ready to begin, take a sip and choose a letter of A or B which indicates which player you are. You can only ask yes or no questions and they will only ask the same back. When the spirit sips, you must take a sip. The game ends when both glasses are empty. The spirit will do what it can to get you drunk in order to learn your most personal secrets, so keeping your wits about you is essential, especially if you have low alcohol tolerance. If you complete the game successfully, the spirit simply raises their glass and fades to the shadows, but you must remain seated while this happens. At this point, 
it is safe to blow out the candles, turn on the lights, and leave the room, for the game is over. Upon losing the game, the spirit will blow out the candle, and a harrowing experience awaits you beyond the hangover. The spirit now haunts you. Turning on the lights is the best defense at this point, since ghosts and spirits tend to avoid the light, but it's not guaranteed safety. The player will be followed and tormented by the victorious spirit as it haunts their day-to-day -day life. The only release from this is if the player speaks these words. This soul is yours. It is yours to do business with. If done correctly, the spirit will have the player go unconscious and the soul taken into a strange room while the spirit uses the body as they see fit. You will stay in this room until some other curious individual wants to play the game, but if you lose once more, you return to this room. Their soul was trapped all this time as a slave to another, and they have a lot of suffering to inflict upon their new toy. Alexander had broken the rules of the ritual, and his fate was already sealed that night. The main rule that was broken was that he wasn't alone. He summoned a malevolent spirit by the name of Per, a convict that broke the ritual rules intentionally to try to escape prison and played the game a year before Alexander. He became a madman, barely able to say complete sentences or think rationally, the true personification of a demon. Once his spirit was free that night, and seeing all the fresh bodies to possess, he began to lose control as his natural body began to rapidly age. Pear took control of Alexander's body and ran out into the streets. Some called him a genius, others a madman, but make no mistake that this was one feat Alexander would not live to regret. If you want to play the Dead Poets game, follow the rules and play alone. The Very Last Step There are many stories of rituals to gain great power, but how far are you prepared to go to gain the power to grant any wish you desire? To perform this ritual, you will need only two things. A staircase that consists of more than six steps, and a protective charm. This charm doesn't need to be a religious relic, but it must be something of extreme personal significance. This will act as your one and only protection for what you will face. To begin the ritual, ensure the time is roughly midnight. It doesn't have to be exactly midnight. Ensure the staircase walkway is pitch black before beginning your descent. Ensure your protective charm is held tightly. When you are ready, carefully descend the stairs. If you trip or turn around at any point, then the ritual will fail. As you go down, you will soon realize that the staircase is longer than it should be and the ground floor has not yet emerged. Eventually, you will reach the bottom where there's a dim red light in the room with a gaping hole. Close your eyes and count to 10, clasping your charm and saying clearly, I wish to gain the power of wishing. This will transport you to a gray room with a red chair and a black chair, and no exit. The devil will take a seat in the black chair, and you will need to sit at the red chair. The rules will be explained to you. Six games will be played, and you must win at least three of them to be deemed worthy of the devil's power. The first few games, the devil asks you about the best times of your life, your greatest fears in full force, and the devil himself feigning forgiveness. The later games, the devil will transport you to a maze that is made up of moments in your life, to a duel with a doppelganger of oneself, to a room filled with mirrors of people you've met in life showing their true feelings of you. The final game requires the eventual termination of a corpse-like figure from a revolver, where the devil himself will congratulate you on completion of the task. It is important to never shake the devil's hand, and instead, bow and leave through a door that just appears in the room. This will transport you back into reality on the top step with only a few minutes passing. 
If you successfully won at least three games, the devil has deemed you worthy of his power and you have been granted the power to grant any wish you desire. But be careful. The devil is crafty and his power will always seek to backfire on you from poorly worded wishes and twisting your requests against you. If you failed to win at least three games but were successful in completing them all and continue to hold your protective charm, then you are unworthy of the devil's power, but your efforts have prevented the devil from claiming your soul and he has released you. The devil's plan was to claim your soul by getting you to drop your protective charm. If you shook his hand, then he will command you to release your charm, forcing your loss. You will become the newest addition to the many lost souls doomed to eternal torment in the fires of hell. Another use for a bouncy castle. We all know about the fun-filled experiences with a bouncy castle, but there's a ritual where you can send your consciousness back in time to your childhood. As with many rituals, this is not without risk, so be sure to follow the rules carefully for your own protection. You must be over 18 years old for it to work, any younger, and you're too close to childhood. What you'll need is a large bouncy castle and a selection of specific childhood objects. The greater sentimental value for each, the better your chances to succeed. The objects can be whatever you hold dear, but should always include a crayon, speakers, and four candles. For the best and safest results, the ritual should be performed around sunset, or golden hour, while avoiding nighttime. To perform the ritual, ensure your castle is properly inflated and place the four candles outside on the four corners and light them. Draw a circle on the castle with the crayon and place it outside, preferably nearest the entrance to the castle. Utilize all of your childhood items here, and when you're done, place them outside the circle. If you don't utilize all, then the ritual has now been compromised, and you must end it. Prepare the speakers with a childhood song that holds sentimental value to you and place them outside the circle. Take a deep breath, lay down, and think of your memories from childhood, and say the words, I do not acquiesce, concede my time. Once completed, your body will go numb. After a couple of minutes, your senses should return to you, and you can open your eyes. If successful, you'll awaken to the sounds of laughing children and adults conversing. Your mind has been successfully sent back in time to your childhood self. This is where the significance of your chosen items come in, as all but the music will be present with you. Each one represents a different sense. If you have chosen well, then your senses will operate normally. Poorly chosen ones of low significance will lead to weaker and unbalanced senses, which may serve as a danger later on. You may exit the circle and explore the party in your childhood body. It's your birthday, and only yours, with people that resemble important moments from your childhood. You may play with the children, talk to the adults, and even learn something from people who are no longer alive today. The realm you find yourself in is different from our own. The bouncy castle is a vehicle anchor to reality. The further you wander from it, the more distorted things become. Don't hang around too long, you're on a time limit. The music you set starts playing the moment you arrive. Once it finishes, your protection ends, and you'll be exposed as an outsider. However, time moves differently here. Each minute in your world is about an hour in this realm. Your only measure of time is the position of the sun and its movement through the sky, which is why it's ill-advised to perform the ritual at night. Should your protection end and you become exposed, the party will stop and everyone will stare unmoving at you. To perform the return ritual, slip back into the bouncy castle where your supplies should be waiting. Once everything is set and the crayon placed where it was when the ritual started, utilize your childhood items again, but in reverse, which will include destroying several of the objects. Leave the crayon where it was and lay in the circle again. Close your eyes and fill your mind with the joys of being grown up. Say the following. We concur on this matter and I wholeheartedly return. 
your senses will leave you once again, and when they return, you'll be back in your adult body. The music you prepared will be at the last 30 seconds of play, and your other supplies will be gone, besides the crayon and music speakers. You must draw an X through the circle to close the ritual properly, then deflate the castle. Congratulations, you have successfully completed the ritual. However, it is not advised to perform the ritual again, as your soul has been marked. The beings from the other realm will know of your presence, and will come for you if you invade again. You may be wondering, why do I need to cross out the circle? This is because if you don't, the portal remains open, and the other realm beings can come to our side, seeking out the one who invaded their realm. Lights out. When the world sleeps under a shroud of darkness, there exists a sinister game known by many names. Lights out, lights off, light switch, room wars, or simply switch. It's a game with a history as old as the light bulb itself whispered about in hushed tones across America Europe and Southeast Asia. This game is not for the faint-hearted or the vulnerable. It's a perilous endeavor, and only those with a fit body and a sound mind are advised to play. To embark on this eerie journey, you'll need a building with at least eight rooms, each equipped with a functioning light switch. It's crucial that these rooms are devoid of obstructions that might impede your access to the switches, open kitchens, closets with no light sources, and separate buildings on the same property don't qualify as rooms. The game has strict rules and prerequisites. Number one, the game must be played between 12 midnight and 4 a.m. Number two, it must take place in a closed off building with at least eight rooms and or hallways. Number three, player one, meaning you, must be alone during setup. Number four, there must be an even number of lit and unlit rooms at the start. Number five, if the number of rooms is odd, flip a coin to decide the last room's state. Number six, the game continues until one player turns all the lights on or off. Number seven, no tools or advantages are allowed. Their use results in an automatic loss. Before starting, carefully consider the time and weather conditions. Playing during a thunderstorm or snowstorm is discouraged, as a power outage will lead to an automatic victory for it. Additionally, ensure all windows and doors leaning outside are closed and locked. To summon it, place a personal item of value in a room of your choice. If you want it to be in the lit state, leave the light on. If you prefer it to be in the dark, turn the light off. Arrange the lit and unlit rooms, adhering to the even number rule. Write down a realistic desire on a piece of paper and place it in your starting room. Make sure it has an opposite room to yours. Matching the lit and unlit state, the most critical step is the incantation and ritual. Details of which are purposely omitted for safety reasons. Patiently search for the ritual, but be warned, once you start, you'll have only 60 seconds to return to your starting room. Failure to do so will require you to retry the ritual, preferably the following night. As the game commences, the lights will flicker slightly. Your task is to dash through the building switching lights on and off to 
depending on the initial state, a feeling of unease and dread signifies it is nearby, but it won't harm you during the game. The time taken by it to switch a light ranges from 2 to 5 seconds, decreasing as the night progresses. Try to complete the game within the first 5 minutes. Though some players have endured for up to 38 minutes, the game concludes when the lights flicker again, and all rooms are either fully lit or plunged into darkness. If you win, your desire will be fulfilled in the future, as countless successful players, including actors, CEOs, and historical figures, have attested. As for those who lose, no one has come forward with their story. Only records of their preparations exist, and they have mysteriously vanished, leaving behind few clues. Some speculate that the losers become it, but there's no concrete proof. In conclusion, be cautious when considering playing lights out. The rewards are enticing, but the consequences of losing are shrouded in darkness. The Flush Market In the heart of Scotland, there existed an alleyway known to only a select view. This mysterious place was called the Flush Market. Its name, whispered among the curious, hinted at dark origins tied to butchers and even the world's oldest profession. However, both assumptions were wrong. As the saying went, flesh is not the product, it is the currency. The market hours stretched from dusk to dawn, and those who sought its eerie offerings paid the entrance fee with a mouthful of their own blood, sipped from a crystal glass. To gain access, one had to walk halfway down the alley, take a swig from the blood-filled glass, and then spit it onto the rough brick wall. The blood would bubble and spread until it formed a grotesque scab, eventually flaking off to reveal a normal-looking door. Stepping through that door was like entering another realm entirely. The vast, dimly lit chamber stretched out in every direction. Stalls run by vendors from across the world lined the central aisle, each peddling their own macabre deals. The vendors were persuasive, beckoning visitors to approach with signs boasting their eerie offers. For a single breath, they promised to reveal the weather for the following day, even in the age of smartphones. If seeking forgiveness, a vendor would pin your hand to a table and amputate your pinky finger, warning that such redemption could only be bought twice. To ensure a trade's integrity, a pound of flesh was demanded as collateral. Although the traders in the flesh market always adhered to the letter and spirit of the deal. For those wishing to converse with birds, the price was steep. One of their own eyes. The salesperson would grab them by the throat and meticulously pry their fingers into their eye socket. Some daring shoppers ventured even further, parting ways with their sexual organs for artifacts and spells to prolong their life. These transactions were described as unpleasant and messy, and only a rare few were willing to make such gruesome exchanges. Many vendors in the flesh market had made this sacrifice themselves, demonstrating an eerie and almost unnatural insight into the human psyche. The rarest and most coveted offering was the promise of guaranteed happiness for the rest of one's mortal life. To purchase, one had to give up their own heart, which would be removed with surgical precision. The seller would grant a moment to brace for the impending cut, ensuring that the organ was taken cleanly. However, the flesh market had its limits. The brain could not be fully traded, as one ill-fated soul discovered when they attempted to exchange the part related to memories. But there were strict rules that all patrons had to abide by. Never could the organs of another person be used for deals. Attempting such trickery would result in taking from the thief whatever they had tried to barter. An eye for an eye was the unwavering principle in the flesh market. 
Lastly, a seller would react with the same ferocity if anyone dared to offer their soul in exchange for a deal. Why this particular transaction couldn't be made remained a profound mystery. The flesh market was a place where the currency was flesh and the bargains struck were bound by unbreakable and otherworldly contracts. How to Access the Forbidden Wiki The Wikipedia game is a small internet challenge where you highlight one topic page and click on related hyperlinks until you reach the pre-specified destination page. Well, there is another version of this challenge simply known as the Forbidden Wiki. Fair warning, performing these actions is risky and potentially life-threatening. You will require a device that is capable of internet connection, such as a laptop or a mobile phone. You must ensure that any personal data stored on said device is removed beforehand. You'll want to make use of any public locations with internet access, like the Wi-Fi of a public library, shopping mall, or cafe. You can use your home as the space to perform the ritual, but it's not recommended. The use of a weapon, a bodyguard, or a vehicle is also optional, in case you encounter anything too out of the ordinary. As for the game itself, sit down at your preferred location and visit a highly popular Wikipedia page. From there, traverse via hyperlink to an extremely obscure page only a handful of people might know about, one that gains very little traffic. Following this, click on the Wikipedia homepage find another popular article, and repeat the process. After three to five attempts, you will be redirected to a blank Wikipedia page with the title saying Information Limit, along with a random string of numbers and text. Make sure to copy the string down and leave the location you are at. Do not return to this location under any circumstances. Go to a place without any internet access and open the information page again. Refresh it, and a login screen will pop up asking you to enter the access point. Paste the string of numbers and text from earlier into the tab, except for the last two digits. Congratulations, you are now on the Forbidden Wiki. The Wiki is best described as articles from alternate universes or parallel worlds. These articles detail things like the Great Lakes Incident, the Grand Canyon Void, Channel 51 News, The Man Inside Your Head, Eye in the Sky, and the Snowstorm Angel. However, it's best advised you don't linger on the articles for too long, as beings from alternate realities may notice you peeking at their info and will want to stop you from doing so. Several players have taken to referring to these creatures as lurkers, appearing somewhat humanoid, while others are misshapen abominations. This is where the weapons and bodyguard will come in handy. As stated, while looking at the information on the alternate Wikipedia might be interesting, it is best not to do so, as there are some horrors best left unseen. The Man in the Fields Ritual The Man in the Fields is an ancient entity resembling a scarecrow with a bovine skull. Originating from the British Isles during the Middle Ages, many people viewed the ritual as a form of devil worshipping. While the ritual is considered extremely dangerous, it can help the user gain good luck for a whole year. What you'll need is a home that's preferably in the countryside and with a large backyard, a non-electrical source of light like a candle or oil lamp, a crucifix, and a watch. Wait until sunset with no one else in the area, place a crucifix in a room with only one door, and make sure all the cabinets, doors, windows, 
or anything that can open are closed. This is your safe room in case the ritual goes wrong. Once the sun is set, head out to your yard and turn on your light. Face your house and whisper, but who will scare the crows away seven times? On the seventh time, you'll hear a voice behind you. Immediately walk back to your home without looking back. Get inside and close the door. Now the ritual has officially started. Throughout your house, everything that can possibly be opened is open. Your main goal is to close every opened object in your household before midnight. This includes your doors, shelves, windows, bags, and much more. While you go around your house, you might spot a pale figure in the corner of your eye. He won't harm you, but don't stare at him. He's referred to by some as a herald, an entity that makes sure you play the game fair. Whatever you do, do not under any circumstances look at the backyard while the ritual is in progress. If you do, you'll see the man in the fields, his body on a post like a scarecrow. Once you've seen him, he'll start to get off his post. You'll only have a minute at most to get to your safe room and lock the door. Once you've closed everything in your household, head to your bed and go to sleep. Depending on the time you started the ritual, you'll get the chance to have extraordinary good luck for a full year. If you start at 9 p.m., you'll be safe from any physical harm, including diseases and any potential injuries. If you start at 10 p.m., it'll be the same as before, but with the addition of you being financially safe, with the chance of you becoming a millionaire. Only a rare few have started the ritual at 11 p.m. and live to say what happens. However, the few who did claim that for a year their luck skyrocketed with them being able to do anything without there being negative consequences, best proceed with prudence, as by the end of the year, your luck will run out, so it's best to have a contingency plan for when that does eventually happen. Eleven miles. Everyone has something they truly desire, and this ritual can help you achieve that. The only item required for this ritual is a vehicle. A small car is preferable since you'll need the cover of night to be safe, and you won't be as exposed compared to an ATV or a motorcycle. You can pick any road to do the ritual on, as long as you're in the right mindset to do it and it's a long stretch of road surrounded by woods. It must be nighttime when the ritual starts, with no other vehicles beside you, and you must do this ritual alone. When you're looking for the road, some signs of what you desire may start to appear. If it is love, rose petals will fly in the wind. If it is wealth, the glint of the leaves on the trees might resemble diamonds. If it is revenge, you'll feel a huge sense of rage bubbling. Once you're certain you've found the road, turn your vehicle to proceed down it. Once the ritual starts, you're no longer in your own universe. Time has now stopped and will only start again once the ritual is complete. If you try turning back at this point, you'll be left in a loop with your car breaking down eventually. From this point onward, do not turn on the radio, use your phone, open the windows, exceed 30 miles per hour, or leave your vehicle at any time until the ritual is over. As you proceed over your 11 mile route, you will be progressively haunted by dropping temperatures and shadowy figures attempting to disrupt your drive. The further along you go, the more intense the cold becomes and the more invasive the shadow entities are. They mummer, they may scream, they may even claw at the car, but they cannot harm you unless you allow them to distract you. If your vehicle stalls, you must start it up again, lest you be claimed by the shadows. On the final mile, things change. Your vehicle will shut off. A clearing will be in front of you, a blinding bright red light up ahead. Close and cover your eyes. Do not look at your current destination. Eldritch sounds will bombard you as you'll feel an intense heat, destroying your vehicle, the sensation of your skin and bones burning away and overtaking you. As long as you keep your eyes closed for 31 seconds, you'll be fine. Once those seconds are up, power will return to your vehicle, and you can finally open your eyes. Drive on, and your vehicle will arrive at a dead end. Relax, 
Close your eyes and picture in your mind what it is you traveled all this way for. Once you've done so, open them and you'll find yourself back where you started. The ritual is now officially over. If you desire something physical, check in your car if it's a large object, or on your person if it's small. If you desire something non-physical, drive back home and sooner or later, your wish will come true eventually. There isn't any catch to the ritual, besides some reports of vivid hallucinations and nightmares from the 11th mile. If you're not yet satisfied with what you got, then you're right back at the start of the road. Nothing is stopping you from a second drive. Did you enjoy the video? Why not click the bell icon and subscribe to see more content from us at tats.videos. Stay safe and have a wonderful Halloween. And now let's see the creators of this video.